From Alachua, Florida, I'm Amrita Kaley. I'm Krishna Kishore. And I'm Nam Amrita. Welcome to Nectar Talks from the heart of New Raman Reiki, the largest Hare Krishna community in North America. And the home of thousands of Bhakti Yoga practitioners. In our ongoing series of live interviews, we explore a range of spiritual topics, introducing you to inspirational community members and guest speakers with diverse backgrounds and experience. Like bees searching for nectar, we seek to extract pearls of wisdom from how they live their lives and the spiritual lessons they can impart to us and our listeners. If you're seeking nectar, look no further. All right, let's get started. Amarita, thank you. Hare Krishna, welcome to Nectar Talks. This is episode 17, and we're super excited to do this uh, episode. It's actually my first episode as a co-host. Thank you very much to the wonderful team to embracing me, uh, part of their Nectar Talk family. And you may be confused, who's interviewing who? We're all here kind of like together. But actually, we're taking this great opportunity to interview Amrita Kaley and Leela Kishore. Um, They're a vibrant, very dynamic duo, a power couple who have a very interesting life and have inspired many around them. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Jai. And (laughs) Kish, we're so excited to have you lead your first episode with us. Thanks again for joining. The I'm following you though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome guys. We did a little bit of homework on you guys, did a little bit of research. So I'm just going to give a quick little bio. Is that okay? Am I allowed to do that for you guys? Sure. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Let's see if I get anything wrong. You can grade the bio at the end if you want. Totally. I'm just going to be like, she was born in Paraguay. (laughs) (laughs) Make it more interesting. (laughs) So, um, Lila Kishore, uh, you were, you grew up in Delhi, right? You grew up in Delhi and you moved to the U.S. when you were 17. Mm -hmm. And Amrita Kaley, she's from the panhandle. (laughs) own from Florida and uh, both of you met in Jacksonville right mm-hmm. yes Bo- both of you met in the Krishna club that actually I got the great pl- privilege to be a part of uh, the Krishna club a-, a couple times I think and um, both of you did services there also um, you, j- you got married in 2013 so you've been together about nine eight nine years yeah okay. Am I, am I still going? Am I on a roll? Am I yep. on a roll? Okay, yep. okay, awesome. <laughs> and, Great, I'm doing so good. And you are the lucky parents of two children, two beautiful children, who I've had also the great pleasure of meeting. And um, Amrita, you studied uh, anthropology and religion, right? You were a chaplain for about seven years. Yes, that's right. And Lila Kishore, you um, were a computer, or you are a computer engineer. Correct. Mm-hmm. Awesome. How did I do? A well, plus B. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and both of you are vibrant souls and very inspiring uh, to many and to myself. So uh, that's also part of the bio. <laughs> the feeling is thanks. Me. Thanks for that awesome introduction and bio, Kish. Um, so I want to get started. Um, some of the uh, milestones we identified for you are how you met, your upbringing, of course, your service through the Bhakti House, and then we would love to get into what your current life looks like. But tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the details of your upbringing. Um, Amrita Kaley, we, we did a whole episode already. So if you, if you want to know the full on details of, about Amrita and her hobbies and all that, go check out episode one. Um, so I'll start with, uh, with you, Lila Kishwar. Tell us a little bit about growing up in Delhi, um, what life was like for you over there and um, your experience when you eventually moved to the US. Hmm. Yeah, so I grew up in Delhi. Um, I, it was, you know, 
life in like a um, normal middle class family, nothing, um, nothing special. And I moved to US when I was 17. That was a hard transition. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not have any family here. So um, coming here, I remember I couldn't even have, um, I got a, a, a debit card and I tried to use it at a subway one time. And they were like, oh, this won't work. It's actually an ATM card. So since I was not 18, I couldn't even get a debit card. So I had an ATM card. So I had to get to the ATM to do that. So there was a lot of things that like that, like I had to um, transition into. Uh, There was a big cultural shock. Um, That was, it took me about a year to find some friends. Um, It was, it was hard um, to kind of get into, I, I, um, I came to Michigan, so the town was really small. So coming from like a big city in Delhi where, you know, you have to find a way to not find someone and, you know, be in a secluded place. It was an easy <laughs> thing where there were like, you know, a few thousand people. And when I first landed, the college hasn't started. Um, so it was, it was, uh, it was a big uh, cultural shock. And then it took me a while to kind of get into um, into the rhythm and finding some friends and people I could relate to. And that helped. Right. Well, culture shock also maybe because of the weather too, right? Yeah. I, I saw snow for the first time in my life. <laughs> I loved the snowfall. It's like, Oh yes, I was really looking forward to it. But then that evening itself, I was done with it. Like I, <laughs> I had like a, a mile walk from my bus stop to my apartment and, you know, walking in snow for a mile, I was like, all right, I'm already done with it. Oh, my God. That's what you hear. You know, though, the parents say, I used to walk uphill both ways. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thank you so much. And um, I- I'm, I'm going to shift a little bit now to Amrita. I know that you did an episode with uh, Nam Amrita. But um, in this episode, I don't think we got to hear you expand a little bit about um, things from your youth and how they have shaped your life. So if, if you don't mind telling us a little bit of, of maybe what, have, what might have been unique like during your upbringing that you can say that has shaped you of who you are now. Wow, I love that question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is that my parents loved the outdoors. Um, like we, we, we weren't allowed to go to theme parks. <laughs> Basically we went camping. Like, I mean, we weren't hardcore campers. We used a camper, you know, but, uh, like car camping style, but we, that's what we did together. We took vacations in nature. Um, mm-hmm. I grew up spending a little part of the summer each year in the mountains in North Carolina. That's where my mom lives now. Um, so now we're bringing our kids to the places where I grew up. Um, it's like my, my, my second home. Um, that has, that really had a, a, a really big impact on me, I think. Um, and I'm so grateful to my parents for that because that's how we had fun, um, was outside. And, um, you know, when uh, the other thing that comes to mind is, you know, my parents got divorced when I was 10 and my mom came out as a lesbian. And, you know, that was obviously that was really hard for everyone. It was very hard for my mom, too. Um, And I think it was a huge lesson in becoming authentic. And, um, you know, from a very, very young age, from that time, I felt catalyzed to sort of search for like truth and authenticity, because, you know, if people are pretending to be something they're not because they feel pressured or they feel like they won't be accepted for who they are, then like, you know, then, then sad things happen, you know? So I feel like um, that was a lesson that I learned young. And, um, and that must have been at a time where it wasn't as common that that would happen right because that was what in the 90s you're saying when you were 10 yeah that's so true uh, I was telling him like I would I lied for a while about like how I was getting to school because um yeah I maintained like the facade that my parents were still together because it was scary to have a gay parent oh. I remember when I met um uh, my future very close friend whose dad had just come out as gay like around the same time and um it was like finding a 
it, it was like finding, you know, oh, it was, it was a treasure. It was a treasure. It was so valuable. So yeah, it, it, um, there was a lot of, of things that came out of that lifelong learning. So, so do you think like, cause you know, like kind of shaping who you are, do you feel like that is kind of giving you a little bit more kind of like the, a callus of, of where you can use your accepting and, you know, not care so much what other people think and just kind of be happy with what's happening in your life? Um, I know well, that's like a loaded question. I'm just, it's kind of like an assumption that I'm thinking of like, wow, if you went through the process through, during the nineties, accepting yeah. that, like, how did that, what did that shape for you to not right now? I think that's a, that's a really powerful question. And it, um, I think when I was younger, it created a callus, but it wasn't a mature callus. So my attitude mm -hmm. of like, I, I am who I am had sort of like, um, some negativity behind it. There wasn't like a softness to it. I was a little bit more rebellious in that way. And, um, you know, when I found out obviously through conversations with schoolmates that like, you know, gay people go to hell. And, um, I just said, well, then then I don't believe in God. And I became like a really intense atheist. So that for a while, so that callous was, was immature. Um, and I feel like it has taken a lot, a lot, a lot of time that Krishna has, has um, revealed sort of the tenderness of like grief underneath that of, you know, um, having to go through something really intense as a child and has transformed it into uh, over time that yes, I need to live my own life and I need to um, do what's right for me in my search for truth. Um, but I do that from a different place now, from a, I think a softer place. And do you have siblings, Amrita? I do. I, um, I have a sister, a biological sister, Erin. She's older. She lives in California. She's one of my best friends. Um, I have a younger stepsister, Courtney, and she passed away um, two years ago from oh. leukemia. Wow. She's our angel. And I have stu two stepbrothers from my dad's marriage. Oh, nice. And what about you, Lila Kishore? Do you have siblings? I have one younger brother. Okay. Awesome. Did, did you get to did you get to give him knuckle sandwiches growing up, pick on him a little <laughs> bit, give him some danda? <laughs> yeah, we did we did fight a lot. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You you guys still keep in touch? Yeah, so he he right now lives in um, Long Island, New York. So we are we don't get to see each other that often, but we're really close. Oh, cool. cool. Right. Yeah, thank you for sharing those um, early catalysts, like you call them, into um, kind of looking inside and to your identity. It's interesting to hear how that that uh, started for you. Um, Let's jump a little bit ahead and um, talk about how you guys eventually came to Krishna consciousness. Um, Amrita Kaley, we know that you've been very much a resident of the Krishna house and have held some, uh, some management positions there. Uh, Leela Kishore, tell us a little bit about how you joined, uh, how you discovered the devotees and what that um, was for you spiritually based on your spiritual background from growing up in India. Yeah, so, so one part of my upbringing was that I was really fortunate. My aunt, my Masi, my mom's sister, she lived in Vrindavan. So oh. she, she moved to Vrindavan when she was in her 20s, so way before you know, I was born. So growing up, um, like every month or so, we would take the bus ride from Delhi to Vrindavan. So like for the weekend, we would just spend, spend in Vrindavan. Mm. um so it was just you know That's so amazing <laughs> i know now i look back and you know what like like how, what what a blessing it was you know at, at the moment obviously i didn't realize you know a 10 year old being able to walk you know in the in the gullies of the vrindavan and you know being <laughs> and being like like where the bridge vases really knew us because we would be coming and you know staying in our um aunt's budget kuti it was like this really sh like small room and we'll you know my brother and i will sleep on the floor and and uh, so it was it was really a, a blessing and now, then, did you come from a vaishnava background to begin with not really so my my family is what you would call like the delhi like punjabis okay uh, 
Yeah, so um, growing up, like my dad's side of the family, they would um, go to the Sikh temple. Um, a lot. So that was kind of their uh, religious background or tradition. And they followed mm-hmm. this um, impersonalist uh, philosophy called Radha Swami, okay. uh, which basically uh, focuses a lot on the Paramatma realization. Okay. When you follow the four regulated principles, um, you get initiated, you get this mantra that you meditate on. Uh, and then the focus is kind of, you know, finding God within. Um, mm-hmm. So that's kind of the philosophy. So that's what I really um, grew up with and kind of gravitated towards um, growing up. Um, however, there was always um, what really I found was missing. I would really, so they would have these Sunday satsangs. So I would go to the satsangs and I would really like hear attentively. And they will always like, oh, today we'll be talking about what, god looks like or what is god like that who do you need to meditate on or who that one is that you need to meditate on anytime that part came and i would listen really carefully but there was no description they're like that god is one and you need to find him and i'm like well that's not help you know that's not helping a 10 year old right and so that question just always stayed with me i did i did go to the krishna balram mandir and you know the what the bridge was called like go to the Angrej Mandir. So I would go to there when I would go to Vrindavan. So I'll, I'm, I met the devotees at that time. So that was the first time, you know, I, I met the devotees was, was in Vrindavan. But you went to time, your wife's Mandir. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at that time, I, I um, you know, that was the first encounter, but I didn't think much of the devotees at that time. Like I didn't really ask any questions or anything like that. Um, so fast forward, um, I was going to grad school at UNF in Jacksonville, and I was coming from a class, and I heard kirtan, uh, the chanting of the kirtan, and I was just amazed, you know, hearing kirtan at a American campus, like, where's that coming from? So I just kind of followed the, the sound where it was coming from, and I kept walking, and there was this monk on uh, harmonium, Krishna Kripa Prabhu, chanting. Nice. And so I, I was really intrigued. And so I asked him, you know, like what his name was. He's like, my name is Krishna Kripa. And I didn't connect the dots. You know, I had been to the Krishna Balaram Mandir, but I didn't connect the dots at the time. And I was just amazed, you know, like here was an American body, like, you know, following fashion of tradition. Like, what was that about? So I asked him a few questions. And at the time, there was a, a UNF uh, Krishna Club uh, event every Thursday. Uh-huh. So he invited me to that. He said, you know, it's every Thursday. And I remember it was right around this time, actually. It was the week mm-hmm. before Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so I, I told him and he said, you know, it's this Thursday. And I was like, I already have plans for Thanksgiving, but I, I'm definitely going to come the Thursday after. Um, Man, and he just got some brownie points for remembering that, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> Sorry, sorry for interrupting. So and then, so and then you said you were gonna go to it. So yeah, so I I I, I was gonna go to it. And at the time, there was a friend of mine. Um, um, she was also really looking for something spiritual. So I thought, oh, this will be a good fit, and I'll take her um, to this uh, Krishna Club meeting. So that Thursday, I went, and Amrita Kelly did the yoga class, and Dina Bandhu Prabhu um, led the discussion on Bhagavad Gita, and I found it really. Um, you know really helpful and i wanted to be with like people like that at that time i was looking for you know hanging out with people who are more spiritual so i was like oh this is perfect place um to hang out which with like Dino, which Dino Bandhu? uh in gainesville Dina Bandhu prabhu oh, okay okay Dina Bandhu prabhu from gainesville yeah, yeah 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 so um so he he so i you know so i started talking to him uh became good friends with him and that's how i really started to uh, meet the uh, started asso- associating with the devotees more, and then what really got me was the aspect of when you know realizing, oh, Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead, and what that one that I always wanted to know looks like. What are the pastimes? And that was just like you know a whole new realm opened for me, um, and then there was no looking back from there, right? So that was the that was the attraction for me. Um, was realizing that even though you know like i went to the temples and i would see the deities or the murti of krishna but you know that it was like any other demigod at the time right or any other murtis and i didn't know the philosophy that well so that was what really attracted me and um what got what worked for me 
Hmm. Wow, that's so you're so advanced. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 because you know, like it's like who else is like I was walking on campus. I followed the sounds of the holy name, and then that's it. You know, <laughs> you know, it's like. <laughs> Well, it is the mercy of the devotees, right? It's like where if it wasn't for, you know, devotees like Krishna Kripa Prabhu chanting, how would someone like me find this, right? It's like, you you think so like... I'm guessing, so, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, sorry. sorry. No, no, no. You're thinking that. Well, go ahead. So, yeah, so devotees like you, like, you know, I'm still shy of going on Harinam. That's one thing that, you know, I'm like still kind of getting out. But like, here you are, like going on Harinams and, and, you know, you find... People like me are looking things, you know, who 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 are looking out for for right. spiritual life yeah. and, and are able to uh, get connected that way, you know. So yes, it's actually all because of blessings of devotees like you. Yeah. Which I think this kind of leads perfectly to the next question, which is, I'm guessing that's how you guys met, right? <laughs> I was gonna say we haven't had a couple on on the show together for a while, so. Give us, give us the beautiful love story. I'm sure it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll pass it off to each other. But I remember the night he walked in. He walked in like this. Because I think he was coming from the he gym. He had some swag. <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, you know, he, he, um, he sincerely got sort of, you know, there are students who come. There are students who come for prasadam. There are students who come for kirtan. There are students who are come because they like the the um, discussions or the friendships. You know, we're so open about um, Krishna Club being for everybody. And um, but it was obvious from the beginning that um, that Leela Kishore wanted more. And um, one thing that manifested was he started coming to our Ishta Goshti. So Dina Bandhu lived in um, Jacksonville at that time, and I had a little like a very small women's ashram. Uh, it was just me and two other girls. And um, there was a couple of other devotees in town, I guess, and young Krishna yeah. clubbers, our Krishna club yeah. president. So we would meet once every week, I think. Mm -hmm. So we'd meet at Krishna club once a week and then um, together outside of Krishna club once a week. And we would plan ISKCON Jacksonville outreach. Like what is, mm -hmm. what is our mission for Jacksonville? Nice. And so, he, so we, you know, we, we started seeing each other on more of a, um, just a different level. And he became friends with Dina Bandhu. And, um, you know, I have to admit that I was like, I was struggling because I was, I, I called call the country at a certain point And I was like, I think I'm in trouble <laughs> <laughs> because there's this You're having a hard time focusing on the Easter ghost. <laughs> <laughs> So there was this, you, there's this grad student coming around and I think he's quite interested and, um, but, you know, I think I, I think I might have, I'm, I'm in feelings for him and um, what do I do? And I'll, I'll never forget where I was standing and how he said it, but he said, treat him like a bhakta, not a boyfriend. And he was super firm. And um, mm -hmm. I loved that because what he, what he said was that, you know, you, you want to give him the opportunity to explore if Krishna consciousness is what he really wants in his life. And right. should you have anything to do with it, you know, that will convolute everything. So, um, so just, just be very uh, strict, basically. Oh my God, I was so strict. <laughs> <laughs> it, was it was it really freaked him out i think you know <laughs> all but, of a sudden you weren't so smiley anymore <laughs> <laughs> but you know after some time um you know he came to me and he said i have something that i want to talk to you about personally and i said i'm not going to talk to you personally and and he said i know that i wouldn't yeah she wouldn't meet me, me, me like one-on-one -on -one. one uh -huh. time i had to drop like flyers she was like, you can drop it on top of my car. Like, I'm not going <laughs> to. I was, was like, I was overcompensating. How, how, how did that come off for you, Leela? You know, how did you interpret that? To actually at first, hmm. my understanding was that because my only impression of the devotees was my aunt who was celibate for life. She didn't get married and she moved to Vrindavan. Hmm. So that's what I thought of Amrita Kelly, that she uh -huh. actually was, you know, we're never getting married and like she was devoting her life to the mission. And that's, you know, I, that was my thing, how it works. Yeah, yeah, that's a good conclusion. 
Um, but then, so that's what like at first, but then later, I don't know, like in some discussion, I I found out, you know, that like they were trying to find, or she was well, trying to find for a groom or I don't know, somehow like, you know, like these girls are trying to find their right husband. And, I, and right. then I was like, how does that work? I, I didn't think they'd get married. Um, so, but then like, yeah, it was really, I was like, this is like, this is too crazy. Like even in India, no one does that like these days. Like, what is she, <laughs> like, where is she coming from? Um, but at the same time, it kind of, you know, it was really, um, I really admired that, you know, it was really respectful that, you know, like that she had these really strict boundaries to associate with like opposite gender, mm-hmm. um, and coming from like a, a traditional Indian background, um, yeah. you know, that was really admiring for, for me. Mm. Great. Great. So then we had that convert, but then he came to me and he told me like, I have feelings for you. And then he said, I'm not ready to give up my job. <laughs> So, oh, so even though she didn't want it, you were like, we're having this conversation and you just boom. No, well, he, he's no, sorry. Sorry. There you go with that. So line. I had to go, like, I had to really convince her to meet me, um, to have this conversation. I thought this, and I said, like, you know, this is important. Like I need to meet you in person. So somehow she finally admitted to meet me, like, you know, in a, in a public space. It was a health food mm-hmm. store. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I told her that I have feelings for her and I'm really, you know, I understand that, you know, where she's coming from, it is, she's only going to associate or be with someone who is thinking of like a marriage goal, right? It's not just kind of, right. If, and that's like my goal. However, you know, I'm not, that's not something that probably I see happening for another year, but I am, you know, um, looking forward for this relationship thinking that it will go on that path right Mm. um and so i was like well before i even go further like are the feelings mutual like you know or is this one side and she's like of course like and you know there was this like the smile and you know like her (laughs) she was all blushing and she's like yeah they're you know they're they're mutual she's like i've just been pretending (laughs) (laughs) Um, wow so so then you know Okay, you guys developed this relationship. And I know when I met you guys before you had children, there was, then you had like a night, big house. And I heard that you continued to do service, like th- this program, kind of like a Krishna house in Jacksonville. Can you tell us a little bit about your services together of how then, because then you guys just started kind of like doing it, right? Like running it apart from the Bhakti club or Krishna club. Is that right? Yeah, so it was still, so it was Krishna club. And it would meet every Thursday on campus. Um, Dinabandhu Prabhu moved to Gainesville at some after some point. He was really instrumental in the in the club getting started and yeah, mm-hmm. right. So so you know he 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 um, he took the lead and you know he he was handling he did a lot uh, for for a year and a half or so um, and then he moved to to Gainesville and then after that um, Amrita Kelly and I we would do the the club on campus and basically the program was we would do kirtan um and then we would have a class from bhagavad gita and prashadam so that was kind of and um yoga, and yoga a, a brief hatha yoga so it was like an hour and a half to two hours program but like students would just be Stay. hanging out till like 11 in the night like we would come it was really like was, there was a lot of students who would stay till after nine and there's like oh that's when like krishna club becomes club krishna and you know they would just <laughs> So that was was a good name. It was, it reminds me of like the old stories. Like, I just feel like it was like the place to be for, for that first two years, Krishna club was the place to be. And there was a couple students who were really, really um, charismatic Krishna clubbers who would bring, they weren't even that interested in Bhagavad Gita, but they would bring their friends. Cause it was like, you know, the, it was, a, it was a place for the hippie kids to hang out basically, and then get a, this meal together. And um, it, so it was really, really lively. Krishna club blew up at the, at those early years. It was so exciting. Yeah. I think what, what really so worked, exciting. It was, it I was would have loved to get to be there for <laughs> some of the gatherings. I, and I've seen photos in that first episode we did it really, you guys did an amazing job. And then and we you change it to your house. You change it yeah, to so your we house. Right? Doing it twice a week. So we started doing on campus and then also for st- students who were really interested to come to our house. And in the house, we would focus more on philosophy and kirtan. So there won't be like any hatha yoga and we would go like longer discussions. 
uh, and you know going more deeper topics in Bhagavad Gita. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so yeah, so then we started doing twice a week, uh, one program at home and then one program um, at uh, on campus. And, and we'll, we'll, we were also just experimenting with a lot of different things too. Like we did morning, pro- we did like a uh, Bhakti breakfast club on campus. We did, um, we did Krishna lunch to go. <laughs> we tried all kinds of stuff. We, we did. did sunrise. Oh my God. Never commit to doing sunrise morning programs on the beach every single weekend. We did, a- but we did meet devotees that way. We met, right. um, we did Sacred Sounds with Maya Puris. That was a big That hit. was amazing. Um, and you guys, you guys coming was epic. Yeah, it was. I, we I were was... so proud. <laughs> we were so proud. They were like, these are our people. Come and see our people. Like, they, they come from another land. Like, <laughs> so this is we can only do like the three beat on the car tolls. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, yeah, this is what real Kirtan looks this like. This is you it. Know? This is it. You guys, look. Look at what we And I, I remember like I was like the the... Even the evening before, like I was praying, I was like, Krishna, please send at least like 40 students. You know, I don't want like Mayapuris to come and there'll be like only 10 kids in this like big auditorium, you know, it'll be so, but like Krishna sent like, there were literally like 80 to 100 students that came. That oh, it was popping. I remember, I remember it was like, that became Club Krishna, but that was like in the <laughs> afternoon. We didn't have to wait till the nighttime. <laughs> That was an amazing and, and so are you doing things now like what, what what about like your current situ like what are you guys focusing on now any projects currently like what is your where is your focus right now so so before we talk now that transitioned into where we're living right now we um so we thought about buying a house um and at some point i wanted my parents to move and live with us and so um the the plan was well we should buy a house which has kind of like a mother, mother-in-law suite or an apartment where my parents can stay um that way we know there'll be a place for them whenever they decide to to um, move to us and we started looking for a house and we found this house and when we found it we we're like oh this would be something like perfect for starting like a really humble version of krishna house right so there was a house main house that had like four bedrooms on the uh, on the top, uh, 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 a kitchen and everything downstairs. And then there were two apartments in the back. So both like a, a bedroom apartment and two bedroom apartments. So we're like, this will be perfect. Um, Krishna tricked us basically. Like we found this house and then we started thinking, uh, suddenly we hadn't thought about it, but after we saw the house, we were like, oh, we can, we can start a bhakti house. Hmm. I mean, the, I, we hadn't even thought about it. Yeah. Like, Krishna tricked us. Was- and and so then um, we asked Kalakanta Prabhu to come and take a look at the house and see what he thought. And he he really liked the house. And <laughs> he's like, you should definitely, you know, try to do everything in your power to get it, you know. Um, so then we got the house and, you know. For the we- purpose of turning it into an ashram. Yes. Well, and, you know, the, the cool thing is, is that we made the decision. Okay, we don't want to pressure students like, hey, we're buying this house. You need to move in. Right. So we- to Krishna like if you know if you have students for us we're ready and so we had one of our home programs at our old condo and we brought we brought this to them and literally four students came forward and said we're ready we're ready when you are in with you and we all that's a big responsibility like a big project that's like amazing wow we didn't (laughs) so yeah so at the time we didn't realize right like what we were like and 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 that's it, okay. And it wasn't, you know, there were there were things that we learned. There were like really sweet parts to it, and but it really like kind of reminded me, or not reminding, but kind of get a feeling of what early days would look like, right? Like what um, the you know Prabhupada's disciples, this early generation, did. You know, it was just like these small things, and you know they will attract a few students or a few devotees, and that's kind of it, it grew. So. Um, so it was a really wonderful experience. So we had four students. They were like, oh, like we're ready to move in. And we hadn't even moved in the house yet. They had already filled the application. They were already talking to us what it would look like to be in the house, what that service would look, what like their service would be, what they have to do. They were paying to to rent. So that's how kind of, you know, the um, we could we sustain itself. There is no like, you know, like Krishna a Krishna lunch, lunch program. program kind of a thing, right? So there's no income per se. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they were all UNF students so they you know we would do a morning program here together 
And then, you know, they would all commute to UNF, which is like over 20 minute, 20 minute drive because we lived downtown. And, um, and we would have, you know, part of their, part of their stay was that, you know, we would host programs together here. We would go out and do, um, you know, they did stuff by themselves without us all the time. Oh yeah. And they, they were would go on Saturday. Night. So, so yeah, so that's, um, so that's was like for a year and a half to two years, right? So these students stayed with us. Um, out of the four, three of them are initiated now. Um, wow. a couple of them lived at Krishna house in Gainesville. Um, so Krishna really reciprocated with our, you know, humble efforts. And, there and were, we made mistakes. You know? <laughs> it's so humbling to be in that type of a position and to, that's how you learn, right. And you learn so much from just experimenting and going through the process. Yeah. And learning, living with other devotees is really there's nothing like it, I think. I think mm. we've learned something very unique in those situations. Yeah. Well, it's so you wonderful still keep in when... touch with them? Oh, sorry, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we're still in touch with, with all of them. Um, and, you know, they're, they're friends and family for life, you know, like, yeah. yeah, there's no way that we would, like, you know, I would not be in touch with them at all. Fantastic. Yeah, I find it really awesome when we can find a special, you say niche or niche? I don't know what it, what the word is. I think it depends <laughs> on like American You're English French, and British. Right? Yeah, you know better <laughs> than are, we do. <laughs> what are, what, um, yeah, what a, a niche in French is like a doghouse, actually. Not <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, you've you've managed to share Krishna consciousness in such creative ways, and you've really kind of gone out of your way to experiment and learn through the process. And uh, it's just inspiring. I think that's, uh, that's so cool to, you know, kind of identify what, what can you do with your tools and your particular circumstances. And uh, honestly, I'm jealous. I wish I could have been part of that experience. Um, so I want to um, switch gears a little bit. One of the themes we wanted to explore with the two of you is overcoming obstacles through Krishna consciousness. Um, as you know, our main goal for this podcast is to highlight how devotees process some of the challenges life throws at them through the spiritual lens. And uh, we'd love to learn about what those might have been for the two of you, both as a couple and individually. Um, so, you know, I mean, a lot of things come to mind, you know, obviously just married life, you come from different cultures um you know whatever you'd like to share what are what are some of the experiences that uh, you know you you've both had that ashram experience you know so transitioning into many years now now as a married couple with children and having to you know support your family what are some of the things also that uh you know the realizations you might have had looking back on that ashram um education that you've carried on into your into your life So I think, what? Well, I can start, you know, because we had all talked about, you know, some of these challenges beforehand. So sort of like, you know, relating to the timeline, there was something that was on my heart that I wanted to, to bring up. And that was, you know, when I moved to Jacksonville, it was 2012. So I'd been practicing Krishna consciousness for four years. I'd been initiated for two years. Um, so I was really quite young in, in, you know, in the community. Um, but I, but I was encouraged to take on this role of chaplain mm -hmm. at the university. So really, you know, I was so in, inside I'm saying, you know, I'm basically a representative of ISKCON on this campus and with these students. And I had a lot of fear. I had a lot of self-doubt. Um, I, I, it was painful for me sometimes because I was anxious about it. And I would say, I don't know why Krishna has me in this service because it's hard for me. It's hard for me to, to do this. I'm very friendly. Um, but when it, and I, and I love making relationships with people, but when it comes to, you know, giving talks or whatever, I, I had trouble, um, just being myself. Mm -hmm. And so that, basically like letting go of 
you know, being perfect is what I'm trying to say, mm. <laughs> right? Like letting go of this like idea of what a, a devotee who's in my position should look like. Mm-hmm. And instead just coming forward as exactly who I am and making that my offering. And I found that I couldn't get myself to that place, no matter how hard I willed it with my mind. And um, luckily, I was really, really encouraged by a few devotees who knew me very well. And I um, dove deep into um, recovery and therapy. So a a lot of people don't know this. And, you know, you can talk to me about it more if you have questions, but I'm in recovery. I'm in 12-step recovery. Um, I uh, developed eating disorders of um, when I was quite young and um, it wasn't until uh, I was actually introduced to recovery by uh, devotees Mm -hmm. prior to me moving here, but it wasn't until then um, that I dove into uh, the 12 steps, which really helps you look at the fears that feed self-seeking behavior. And once, once I'm able to see my fears and see where am I relying on my own self instead of relying on Krishna or where am I relying on other people or on substances instead of Krishna, um, then I can begin to live one day at a time in like a vulnerable, raw, real, sweet, personal relationship with Krishna, which I never had. I was always like mystified, you know, like I would chant Japa, but my mind was spinning and, and through therapy, I, and through this recovery, I, I really kind of was able to accept exactly where I'm at. And, um, that was a long road. I mean, I'm still, I'm still on it, but I feel like it saved my spiritual life. I, I, I've never sort of made a platform for this before, but I, I'm so sure that a lot of young devotees, either born in the movement or new to the movement, we can support them in any kind of extra holistic healing that is needed to, to, because the Anartanavritti process is intense, you know, like when we start clearing out and Krishna is bringing up all these things in us it can be very painful. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, it was almost like too much. And if I hadn't taken responsibility for my healing and been supported, the important thing is I wanted to take responsibility and I was supported in doing it. Yeah. By um, devotees. By devotees. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. By devotees who said, this is not in place of everything right. that has given us this is not in place of the the healing that comes from chanting your 16 rounds of japa um, and associating and um and hearing from you know uh, reading and and listening and discussing all those things it's in addition to um so you know i think that that's something that was unique to my chaplaincy too i was able to be i was shocked how comfortable i became with that it was nothing to be ashamed of. And over time, it became sort of a part of maybe a part of who I was as their chaplain, um, someone who could talk to them about, you know, um, these, you're having struggles, I've struggled too. And, um, and um, to just be, be real with them about it, and maybe relate to them in, in that way. Hmm. So that's something that um, Leela Kishore has always from day one, from day one, you know, we talked about it. I told him this is, this is an essential and extremely dear part of my life. And he has been nothing but supportive. And it, and it is a time consuming uh, part of my life. I go to meetings, I, I have a sponsor, I talk to sponsees, things like that. So mm-hmm. he's always been, um, he's always been so, so generous about that. And mm. What more could I ask for? That's uh, such a an important um, topic that you're raising, and I really appreciate your uh, your honesty and vulnerability and sharing this with us. I'm always eager to identify what the next generation of devotees can contribute, you know. And I I never look at the foundation 
that has been laid for us by the first generation to be deficient in any way. I think it's just a natural process of history, Vaishnava history, that we each generation get to contribute. Um, and what you're describing, I think, is one of the key components for, uh, for our movement, um, that this become part of our process, not just sadhana and going to the temple, um, but that association of devotees to go to the level of being able to discuss these things and support one another in whether it's attending 12-step programs or forming groups of devotees um, that can relate to a particular challenge together. And it just spiritualizes the whole thing instead of being lost and closed up in our own mind on how do I deal with this? It feels like it's, you know, against, I'm not a good devotee because I have this issue. Right. If we can just open up, first of all, we'll realize that so many devotees are dealing with one thing or another, and then we can support each other in, in those different processes. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so that that's a great, uh, <laughs> very uh, wonderful example of a, a personal challenge that you've managed to, or that you are working through uh, in parallel with your Krishna consciousness. Lila Kishore, um, what could you share with us about, <laughs> about your personal life and uh, what you're working through? Yeah, um, I wanted to... Um, talk about i think one of the challenges that came across as a couple to us was um a few years ago we had a couple miscarriages um, mm -hmm. when we were trying to have a child mm -hmm. um and that's another thing i think is uh such a taboo especially i think for 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 male devotees right i mean there is a part that obviously like i think it's a lot harder from, from my experience emotionally for a woman to go through that experience than, than for a male, um, yeah. because it literally, you know, they, they have that soul in, you know, in, in their body and, you know, they're, they're already kind of associating with that soul at such right. a close level, which, uh, you know, I, I did not get a chance to, you know, what Amrita Kelly experienced. So um, we had first, our first miscarriage before we started the Bhakti house, and then we had our second miscarriage after we had started the Bhakti house. So that was hard um, because we had all the, you know, we were kind of in this ashram, living in an ashram, you know, and we're with these younger students who cannot really relate to, you know, what we are we experiencing and where we are at, you know, there and, and, and kind of what we share with them, you know, right. And we're trying to set an example because they're new to the, in their Krishna consciousness um so mm -hmm. so the part that was hard was one was trying to i think a few things that i learned one was trying to figure out what krishna wants mm. from from it right mm. so the thought came well maybe krishna doesn't want us to be parents because this is probably our life you know this is happening and um these these kids are coming and you know bhakti house is going really well so maybe you know if if we become parents now this will put a pause to that and Krishna doesn't want the service to stop. Right. And I, and we wanted to become parents. So that kind of made us angry towards Krishna that, you know, he's Krishna is not giving us something that we want, even though, you know, it is in, in our mind, it is something that is service, you know, raising children in Krishna consciousness. So can I, I want to interject. I'm sorry. I'm writing this down, <laughs> by the way. I was always, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a, a bold word here, annoyed, when I heard of people being mad at God. I thought, that's so basic. Like, you know, we know Krishna makes arrangements because he's our best friend and he loves us. Right. So if we're angry at God, like, that just shows that, you know, we got issues, not God. So... Mm -hmm. I never really had a lot of empathy for people who would say that mm -hmm. this was the first time that second miscarriage, I was actually furious. Mm -hmm. And I thought we're giving everything we can. We we're, we're, we're 
we're preaching to to a degree that I feel like is is you know sustainable for us. All we want to do is also have a child, and you keep killing our children. Mm. And um, I felt a lot of anger and and self pity, and wow. so that that sh- shocked me. I was shocked by my own anger. I was just I was shocked that I was angry at Krishna, and it was very humbling for me to be able to have that emotion. So you had a reflection on that, I know. Yeah, so so at that time, you know, the anger was there, but the realization that came after was the anger was me trying to figure out what Krishna wants, right? Rather than just being in the mom- moment and just, you know, there, I think it's it's mm-hmm. a it's a tendency is like, oh, what lesson is Krishna trying to teach mm-hmm. out of this, right? Trying like to I don't have to figure think it already. Right. I don't have to overanalyze, you know, philosophize like, oh, is like was the soul here for you know going back like going back to godhead or is that you know like how does that matter and how does that change the anger and the emotions that i'm feeling right and what really helped me in that experience was at that time chaitanya charan prabhu just started coming to us um Hmm. if you i'm i'm sure you you probably know him from like his time in alacha so he just started coming to us and he came to uh, give a talk at Krishna Club, and you know he he stayed with us uh, a couple times, and um, we spoke to him about it. And in the in the in my mind, there were a couple things. One was I was trying to philosophize it. I was angry at Krishna that he doesn't want us to be parents. I was thinking maybe I'm making a big situation in my mind. You know, it's it's as devotees we go through this go through obstacles, and this is like a small obstacle that maybe I'm I'm like zooming in too much. And it's, you know, affecting me too much. I should actually just take a step back and chant my rounds and it'll be all right. Right. Not (laughs) really feeling right. Right. And, and again, that's a realization that I had afterwards. That's like, we are personalists, right. And Mm -hmm. being personal with Krishna means having those real emotions, having those, having that real relationship, just like we want within devotees, among devotees, having those with Krishna. I think if you can be mad at Krishna, (laughs) you are an advanced devotee to begin with. (laughs) <laughs> for real not claiming that. <laughs> uh, so so then what was so so we got this um so we got this opportunity to to talk to Chaitanya Charan Prabhu about it at that time so I told like yeah. um so we were on the way to take him to airport he was getting on uh, we had to take him on his uh, flight yeah and I told him like Amitik Haley brought up like you know like we Prabhu we had this miscarriage and I couldn't believe like the, I can like his expression that was on his face is still in my mind that it was like everything else stopped for him. And he was just so concerned hmm. and he really was just like empathizing and was like, okay, like this is real. And this is a real, you know, it's a real emotion. I'm sorry that you're going through this. And he was like, you know, when Krishna spoke to Arjuna, the Bhagavad Gita, after that, you know, when the yudh was happening, Abhimanyu died, right? And when that happened, Krishna wasn't telling Arjuna that I just spoke Bhagavad Gita to you. Like, I just told you a few days ago that, you know, we're spirit soul. Like, why are you lamenting about Abhimanyu? He's a spirit soul, you know, he's back to Godhead. That's not what Krishna said. You know, Krishna was lamenting with Arjuna Mm -hmm. and he said that's what Krishna wants he is our friend and he he's like for some reason it is sanctioned by Krishna we don't know why this is sanctioned by Krishna but he wants he's here for us and you know I am sorry that you're going through this and I'm here for you and what can I do and to the point like he gave himself so much like he he ended up missing his flight like we just like <laughs> wow we hi we literally hijacked him and you know he he missed his flight wow and that was a wonderful experience for me hmm. as to how to be present for other devotees right mm-hmm. like yeah. like no one wants to hear the philosophy when they're going through a sorrow right like no one wants to hear if they have lost a, a, such a, an important point uh like heard probably, that over and over from uh, devotees yeah yeah so that was um a, a good learning experience for me so that taught me a lot of lessons um and another thing is like it is a, such a common thing that happens you know that actually one fourth of the pregnancy 
statistically are, are miscarriages. So it is really common um, to happen. We did not know that. And, you know, we did not know that. And um, I spoke to some senior devotees and they were like, you will be surprised at like how many devotees come to, to you know, to us to, to talk about it, like how, uh, uh, how common of a, of a thing it is. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it was a hard um, obstacle, but it was a, a big learning experience and helping to how to really be personal with the devotees and how to really yeah. be personal with Krishna uh, was what came out of it. You, know, you 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 mentioned something that uh, oh, did you want to add something to his his realizations, Amrita? I cut you off. I just wanted to say that I I I am grateful that you know the first time we miscarried, I did try to like philosophize the second and keep going. The second one, I let myself totally fall apart for even in front of the students. For thank God it was over Christmas break, so. Most of them were home, but one of them was here. And um, and also Kalakanti Prabhu told me, I told him like, I'm enraged with Krishna right now. And he, he said to me, Krishna doesn't expect you to feel any other way right now. Hmm. He doesn't expect anything from you. He understands. And, and that was, that was like the key that helped me release the anger actually. Wow. knowing that knowing that um krishna can handle all of our feelings um is i feel you know, like that, re that reminds me of a of something that bhakti tirtha swami said you know we know that he he went through some you know struggles personal health things and, and towards the end of his life but also if you hear his you know pastimes of of him preaching in russia and all these amazing you know like KGB Mission Impossible Sankirtan <laughs> stories. It's amazing. And one of the things that he said was that anything that happens in your life, that there shouldn't be that feeling or, or you should try to understand to not let that feeling take over so much of that I can't handle this. Because he said Krishna knows knows you maybe better than yourself. So mm. any obstacle that comes into your life is you can deal with it. Like you you can handle it. You can embrace it. You can move forward. And Krishna knows that. And you no, know, and and it's so beautiful because I mean, seeing and one thing I just wanted to reflect off of what you were saying, Lila Kishore, you were saying. Sometimes you don't want to philosophize when some struggle is coming. And um, I know you guys haven't brought it up yet, but I just learned recently that I know that right now you're battling cancer. And, um, you know, that, that is, a, is a big battle. And, and the, the way that you're, you're holding yourself and, and I see that you're absorbed in, in Krishna consciousness and it's really inspiring. And even though that may be, and it, this kind of comes to a question because uh, off of what you were saying, how does that feel with, you know, going through such a life-threatening experience? You have children, you have a beautiful wife and, you know, the whole kind of not philosophizing what's happening, but at the same time, needing to in order to stay grounded and level-headed and accepting so would you mind kind of go through the motions a little bit ex express you know what 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 are you going through and and how you know and then of course how can we be a part of that but first i would like to understand a little bit of your journey sure um so in june um in May, June timeframe, I was diagnosed with uh, stage two Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and I, I was not, I was not surprised. Um, surprisingly, I was not surprised. <laughs> um, because I think like I was feeling that there was something wrong with my body. Like mm -hmm. I was not feeling um, totally fine for past uh, few months or over last year or so. 
Um, and the feeling that the, honestly, the first thought that came to my mind was if I make through this, then probably I'll be a little bit of, of, of a better devotee than I am starting through this experience. Mm -hmm. If I don't survive this, then I'm probably going to back to Godhead or getting closer, going back to Godhead. So it's like a win-win situation, right? Like I literally <laughs> don't have anything to lose, right? So, um, and- So you are philosophizing it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, and yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't really, honestly, I wasn't trying to philosophize it. It's just, I think it's the beauty of the being in Krishna consciousness for over years, right? Where you really listening to, like listening to lectures and listening to the philosophy, like after, you know, listening the same thing over and over again, doing our japa, our sadhana, it, it does and en get ingrained, um, you know, in your psyche or whatever the word is, right? It's like your, it becomes your second nature and part of your thought process. Right. Right. Yeah. And and I have seen like kind of what you were, you're saying, right? Like we, we hear the, the scriptures, we see the devotees like Bhakti Tirtha Swami Maharaj, you know, a, a wonderful, such an, you know, elevated devotee going through such a hard thing. Then like, who am I? Right. Like it's, it's, it's definitely pot, you know, like possible to, to go through something like this. Right. So, um, so I wasn't trying to philosophize it. It's just being, you know, in the in the in the movement or you know reading the scriptures and listening to lec lectures somehow and the mercy of the devotees and the mercy of, of my spiritual master that it was ingrained that um that it it seemed like a win-win situation like i i was i didn't have any fear um i i i did not have a fear i or don't have a fear of death i felt the first thought that came to my mind was like okay, what about my family? I think it's easier for the person going through it than the people around them. So the thought was, well, it's easy for me because if I'm not feeling well, I can just be in the bed and chant my japa or, you know, just say, hey, I'm, I cannot take care of the kids or I cannot, you know, do this. But it would be harder for Amrita Kaley because, you know, it's a lot more responsibility for her. Like she has to take care of a sick husband and the kids and do her part that she has to do. Mm. Um, and so that was the, that was the thought that came was like, you know, how, um, Amrita Kelly will kind of deal with that. There was no fear of death. We talked about what, what would it like if, you know, if I don't make it, then what's the plan for Amrita Kelly and the kids? So, yeah, you know, we, we talked about that, like in the very beginning, we had a long talk about it. Like what, it, what would my life look like after he passed. I feel like that was really helpful for us sort of acknowledging that reality and then being able to be present today is like, we've already discussed that, you know, we've mm -hmm. already talked about finances and things like that. So mm -hmm. we can sort of focus on what's important today. That's wow. amazing. What, what a, what a great way to plan this, plan this event and how you're living it and, um, just kind of being accountable on, on all sides. So, yeah, yeah, so we talked about, sorry, go, go ahead. No, 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 please. So, yeah. So like we talked about, like, you know, like Amita Kili would move to Alachua. She'll have a better support system with devotees over there. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, it was just, how can I try to focus more um, on like, what should I be doing? You know, what, how can I focus more on, on, spiritually um and then during that time i also had the realization of like how how strong maya is actually like this is one of my realization that i have had you know now that like progressing through it um they're literally like um one thing actually before i i go, go to that point um is one thing is it's been a blessing. It's like, I hear like after getting chemo and I'm really tired and really exhausted, it's so easy to surrender. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's just like, I feel like, you know, in a 90 year old body, I don't want anything, but just my Japa bag in my bed. <laughs> mm. And it's just so easy to just focus on it, you know? So it's just in that way, such a blessing. And, you know, when, and if I get cured, 
I would actually miss those days like that even though I'm in pain but it's just like my mind is just so like surrendered to Krishna which rarely happens hmm. um and so it's such a blessing in in that way you know um that it's 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 such a great experience it's been um and then going back to what I was saying about Maya and then you know there are days that I'm feeling good and it's just so easy to forget about those experience and here I'm you know like taking shelter of Netflix <laughs> and you know seeing that and it's just and that had like gave me the realization like I'm literally like a person who who might be dying in few months and I can understand like how like what Prabhupada meant when he would say you know like you western boys and girls are not scared enough of Maya like what that statement wow. really meant you know mm. was the realization that I have this thing you know which I can get cured, but I, you know, I may not survive yet. You know, the days I'm feeling good, it's easy for me to, you know, forget about my, my, my death or my spiritual life and, you know, take shelters of, of other things. Hmm. Um, yeah. Then that verse in Bhagavad Gita kind of makes sense that those looking for God or those in despair, the inquisitive wanting the money like that. So it's like, we can see in our lives sometimes we're suffering, then it's easy to like, Oh, Nishringadev or Krishna or, to you know yeah wow that's th those are some really deep realizations Prabhu I mean it's and the way that you're kind of just embracing it and going through it and then the support system that you have with Amrita and you guys being very transparent talking about the worst case scenario already in the beginning and I mean, all of that is just kind of like a, a smack to my face in the sense of like reality you know like I mean, I lost my mother. I did see, like, at a younger age, I did see, you know, somebody dwindling in front of my eyes. And, and it, but and then it's so easy to just forget, you know, like you said, Maya is so strong. And then, you know, having this conversation with both of you is just so heart opening and, and mind opening and, you know, really kind of where are we putting our attention, our intention, you know, and our focus. Yeah. And it's, I think one thing, this experience that has shown me is a lot more gratitude for Krishna consciousness and what Prabhupada has given us. Uh, because I would go, when I go, you know, to get my chemo, um, there are people who are literally like, um, they're getting their fear. There's so much fear of death. There are fear of like needles. Like there's one patient that they have to give this uh, seducing drug to where she has to pass out because she cannot go through the chemo. She's really anxious mm. about the whole experience. And so she, they, like the first drug they gave her is just to seduce her. And she's basically sleeping through the whole experience. Mm. And like, I think about like what the experience would be for me if it wasn't for Krishna consciousness, you know, I, it's such an anchor and like a grounding thing for me at the time to be able to have something like that, right? Like if not knowing like, okay, what is that like? You know, what's having all those fears that one may have, but being, you know, in, in mercy and, and of, of the devotees and association of the devotees that I've been so blessed with over the years, um, that those fears aren't, aren't there, you know? Um, so so it's, it's, it's definitely have given me a lot more gratitude um for what we have amazing wow thank you so much for for sharing that experience with us um is there anything that we can do for you as as a community i mean i i just want to shower you with love and and prayers from all the devotees and i'm sure you're getting it already but please let us know if we can be of any help to you too um as you're going through this we I, already feel what you got <laughs> yeah we feel we feel loved and held i mean he's you know me like i would be on facebook going like i have cancer can you please pray for me <laughs> <laughs> he's very <laughs> private he's he's it's not like that in this case and so you know i i respect that and i'm not posting about his cancer either um but um but 
so I just want to say something that I, that I've really inspired by is, you know, he was asked this by the Krishna house, you know, what can we do to support you? And he said, I would like to give class every once in a while, if that's all right. And which I just thought was so cool because like, that's the last thing that I would come up with. Like <laughs> someone was asking me how they can support me. They're like, Oh, make me give class, you know? Um, but that's been so wonderful to like, be a part of that, of him, like, reading the verses and thinking about what he's going to say and talking about it. And, you know, it gets the old juices flowing, um, you know, that so exemplary. I mean, I'm just so inspired by how you guys are processing this. I mean, really amazing. It's like, you're, I, I don't want to call you. I don't want to compare you to Marsh Parikshit because we want you to stay, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, that you would do that. And you're actually in such a great, position you know to speak from your current situation you know that just gives so much potency to whatever you might share uh, with devotees so i really want to go check out your classes yeah no and to add, i mean to add to that not only go and check out your classes honestly i feel like we just started our conversation i i, I think uh, we can easily go another hour i'm only mentioning the time because you said you have to stop at 6 30. It happens to be 6.30 now, but, you know, I, I there, there were other things that actually I wanted to bring up to ask you about, you know, the relationship and making it work with different cultures. I wrote, you know, uh, exploring that and everything like that. And, um, but uh, time is, time is short and yeah, I don't know. Um, Namamrita or Lila Kishore Amrita, do you well, guys want to? Is there, are there any parting words that you'd like to share with us before we close? Um, you know, we really want to give you the, the benefit of the platform, you know, anything you want to share with our listeners before we go. Um, I do want to share that um, I, I, uh, in my last PET scan, they did not find any cancer cells. So the prayers of the devotees. Um, That's amazing. So, you know, it's again, the, the prayers of the devotees and the blessings of the Vaishnavas are, are really powerful. Um, I strongly feel that. And, you know, I have felt all the blessings and prayers throughout my experience and throughout my journey. Um, and the only, yeah, the, the only thing I want to part with, depart with is just, you know, um, just I can, one, like being real with one another, really supporting one another. Um, it is because we all have our, our challenges. I mean, every time I'm speaking to um, a certain devotee, I was, I was actually talking to a devotee friend of ours um, uh, last week. And I was, I was talking through them, like what they are going through and what they have been through. And it literally felt like what I'm going through is just like, you know, a little sneeze, you know, in front of like what they have gone through or what they are going through. So just really trying to be there for one another, because, you know, it is material life is hard. Um, we have challenges that will keep coming. Um, they won't stop. Right. Like I'm sure um, there'll be another one coming in, in, in some time that we'll be talking about, you know, in, in next time. So that's the, <laughs> we could have that's another not, episode if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not going to change. But what what has really the reason that I have been it, we have been able to grow through it is because of the devotees association, because of the devotees being there for us and really, you know, caring for us and having those relationships. So I think it's really important to cultivate those relationships have those like sangha and have that um, friendship to where, you know, you can kind of go to and talk to in, in difficult times and you can really be yourself, you know? Yeah. It's, well, that's um, true. Like the, the best demonstration of toughness is being kind. Mm. Right? Like mm. it's, a, it's so, so, so difficult. It's so easy to kind of be consumed in one's own world, not be empathetic, not this. And, you know, it's to be kind, may, maybe not the easiest thing. Um, and I think that's what you're saying is kind of, if we can be understanding, reach out, you know, be there for one another, be real, 
listen, be communicative, try to be transparent. Like all of those things are not easy things to do, but they're super important and helpful, especially if you're going through something. And like you said, sometimes you don't know, but any anybody could be going through something and we don't know either they're not telling or maybe they're going through something else in a different way that is maybe just as agonizing yeah. than someone who is just say battling cancer who's a self-realized soul like you <laughs> and who can just kind of you know gather it and take it like this and be like yeah it's part of the thing and like and then somebody who's going through a smaller scale issue can be so consuming for them but doesn't mean that it's it's a lesson experience. It just, you know, because maybe that level of realization, it, 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 it's, a, it's a very effective, you know, experience in their life and to try to be empathetic in any issue of big or small. Yeah, thank you for that. Amrita Kelly, did you have any final words for us as well? I do. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Um, you asked about how we manage our differences and we just discovered couples therapy and um, we love it so much. So <laughs> if you've got differences, which we, which I think we all have differences in our own ways. Oh my gosh. It's just been, if you find the right therapist, we have a devotee therapist, which is like an extra special. He's plugging the computer and treat. Um, it's just been an incredible journey. Like, mm blows my mind like what we've accomplished together um since we started that and then the other thing is my my last thought is you know like you know our preaching has completely wrapped up um like because of covid and now the kids right. we're not doing anything outreach wise right. um we're raising a family and so it has been a huge um experience for me to learn that um, we're not defined by what we do, but we're, I think what the mission is, is like how we do it. Where did you go? Sorry, go ahead. Um, or like, yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the reasons why, you know, we're, um, I don't know. I, I, I think it's one of the reasons why I'm in this position is that mm -hmm. I'm to learn that, um, I have a lot of work to do right here. <laughs> I have a yeah, lot of, yeah. I have the whole, see what I realize is if I re if I, if I reach out so far, then maybe I'm avoiding, avoiding the work that's to be done here. And I think mm -hmm. that was a lesson that I needed to learn. Mm -hmm. you know? In reach and outreach, they work interchangeably. It, they support one another. They do. Mm -hmm. They do. And so this is, I feel like this is, this is a time that Krishna is, is telling me like nest and, um, build yourself there. You know, our children are young. Um, I need, I need, I needed to work on that. Mm -hmm. So he's given me n no more flex. Like I, <laughs> I don't have any choice. Like he's saying, he's putting me in position to just work on that. And it's a huge gift too, in that way. And I'll just say like, I'm, I have responded more emotionally than he has to the situation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> like shock, you know, this, that, just rage. I'm sure. I mean, this has, it's probably as difficult for you as, as for Leela Kishore. I mean, in, in your own ways, you're going through this and uh, I can really appreciate the, the gravity of the situation. And I'm just, so inspired by how you're handling it, how you're processing it, how you're able to share it with us. It's really a, a beautiful example for, for all of us. And I've gotten so much out of this talk. Um, one of my great takeaways is that, you know, Krishna was not giving you what you wanted, but mm -hmm. you've learned to understand and try to look into what does Krishna want for you. And that's, that's a really beautiful lesson that um, I think we can all really take with us. And, um, and yeah, focus on the current situation and see where, where does Krishna lie in, in these, these current life situations and just focus on that. You know, we all 
have great aspirations as devotees, um, but it's important to really identify what does what does Krishna really want us to focus on in this particular moment. So we'll close it up here. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us. Kish, you did an amazing job. I think you've, you've given me a run for my money. <laughs> I'm, I'm so, so grateful we have you as a, an interviewer with us. Thank you so much for, for your contributions. Uh, our next episode is going to be with Sharanagati. So you can look forward to that coming up soon. And uh, we look forward to having everybody back on Nectar Talks. Right, yeah, and you know, I, I was supposed to mention a takeaways thing, but and what one thing that I did take away from this is that you guys are amazing. <laughs> With you, Sean and Rita Kaylee, you guys are awesome. Really? <laughs> Definitely. Haribo. Krishna. Haribo. <laughs>